Hello, my fellow music lovers. I'm Alison Hagendorf, and welcome to the show. This is where we celebrate the universal love of music and the rock and roll spirit that lives in each of us. Thank you so much for being part of the show. I would love for you to hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube or follow the show if you're listening. I'm so glad you're here. My guest today is the multi-platinum Grammy-nominated artist, Kay Flay. We talk all about her journey from rapper to alternative rocker, navigating her recent hearing loss while making her new album, Mono, collaborating with her girlfriend from Kid Sister and Vic Fuentes from Pierce the Veil, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and what it is about true crime television that I love so much. And stay tuned after the interview for my sound advice. New music you need to know. It all starts now. I want to congratulate you on this new album. Thank you. Is this your fifth studio album? Unbelievably, is this, this is my fifth studio <laughs> album. This album, and I really want to dive into it, it's an incredible body of work. But not only is it a great album, I feel like this is a symbol of triumph for you. Yeah. You've been through a lot. I've been, I've had a, I've had an interesting through, last year. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I've been you know, in, in thinking about this album and in talking about it, it feels like a debut in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. It feels mm-hmm. like a first record in the sense that first records to me are are really characterized by urgency. Mm-hmm. Like, I need to get this shit out. Like, I made this and I need people to hear it. Yes. You know, when you're first starting out, there is that that feeling and it's it's like a, a positive pressure. And I I felt that with this record um, because, you know, the, the backstory here is I, I was beginning to, to work on demos, thinking about what do I want to do? And I wake up just like literally a year ago, um, wake up and I can't hear out of my right ear and I feel weird. Wow. Um, and, and essentially I, you know, to, to make a long story short, I go to the hospital I'm really sick. Um, I have really bad vertigo. Okay. And because what what we found out is my equilibrium is gone. So like my compass is sort of just spinning. And the nurse looks in my ear and she's like, there's nothing in your ear. You know, my my instinct was like, there's something in my right. ear. Right. There's or something clogging or blocking. An infection or, or yeah. like a hole in my eardrum or something. Like something physically must be happening. And yeah, as it turns out, you know, I saw like every specialist um, in the state of California, and I have something called sudden sensory neural hearing loss, which is like a multisyllabic way of saying mm-hmm. suddenly, for reasons we don't know, you don't hear anymore. Wow! <laughs> and they they don't know what triggered it. You were were you sick originally? No, it just you woke up one day. And you're like, I can't hear. It's weird. Like it felt like a, did it, did it feel like a clogged ear? Like when you like are in an airplane or? No. Okay. It felt insane. Okay. Um, the strangest, the experience of losing my hearing has been the strangest and arguably most interesting experience of my life. I mean, it has been totally bizarre. I think also because, you know, your, your senses you don't realize this until there's a big change, but your senses are so much a part of how your brain is organized. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I had a feeling of fullness in my ear. That's part of it at the beginning. But um, yeah, really, it's just really loud ringing. So I have really loud ringing in this ear, and but but I don't hear. Okay. So it's weird, you know? So it's like really loud ringing, no hearing, like a static noise. Um, we actually feature a version of this noise on the record. Wow. Um, so if you're, if you listen to it, it, it's sort of a sonic motif that, that occurs. Um, and I think especially on vinyl has a, has a pretty interesting feel to it, but yeah. And, you know, we tried, you basically have a month to steroid injections. I did hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which we could spend a whole hour talking about that. It's very interesting. These are like things that sometimes help. They don't know 
why it helps for some people and why it didn't it, help for you. No. <sighs> like you tried all these therapies. But I it did. Didn't I did make it better. I felt good in that I, you know, we were really responsive immediately. Uh, I took action and got treatment like ASAP. None of it, none of it worked. So I knew I had I had exhausted all all my mm -hmm. options. So I felt like, okay, yes, I've done my due diligence in the realm of things that I can control. And so now I just have to acquiesce to the things I cannot control. Right. And one of those things is that a certain number of people every year will randomly go deaf in one of their ears. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm one of those people this mm -hmm. year. And that is difficult for anyone to experience. But as a musician, um, yeah. where your hearing is a pretty major part of your work and your art and your craft and your outlet, Mm -hmm. What was that journey like to go from the panic to the acceptance to the empowerment of it and, and creating an al You started with an album with two functioning ears and I'm Chev Chills and you finish an album with one. I can't even imagine what that experience has been like. You know, I, I think a huge part of it was getting back like on the horse. You know, mm -hmm. that it's funny, like I had really bad OCD as a child. And, and one of the things that my, my psychologist had me do, you know, when I'm nine or whatever is exposure therapy. So I, I know that this is, this is how we break down our fears is, is by engaging with them. Yeah. And, facing and them. That's how we, <laughs> that's how we sort of like demystify the stuff and that's how we are, are able to move forward in life. And so I think maybe because that was just embedded a little bit in my my behavioral patterns and and my DNA to some extent, that was the the mentality. You know, right off the bat, and my manager, he's he's through the glass. Hello, Seth. Hi, Seth. Um, early on, because Seth was you know with me every step of the way, and he was like, "Hey, if you can't make music or don't want to, like it's okay. We'll figure it out." And I think we both had a period of time, a short period of time, where we were like, oh, my God, am I going to have to become like a novelist or something? <laughs> like, oh, my God. Am I going to have to quit this shit? Um, and interestingly, because for me, just, just to put anybody who's, who's listening or watching into, into my shoes for a sec, it, it was a total breakdown of my sensory world. Mm -hmm. So I was really unstable physically incredibly dizzy. And I, by the way, had climbed Mount Kilimanjaro like two weeks before. So I was like, dun, 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 dun. Like the apex of your right. health and wellness and mm -hmm. fitness. Yes. So I'm feeling like, oh, I'm strong. I'm invincible. I'm invincible. And which is, you know, always a dangerous feeling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was very unsteady on my feet. Being in the outside world where there's ambient noise was really overwhelming. So one of the things that two, year, two ears um, uh, provides for a human being is echolocation. Yeah. When you have one ear, you can't tell where sound is coming from. Unless, like, I see your mouth moving. And right. I'm like, okay, Allie's talking. I, <laughs> it's you. Um, but if I close my eyes, strangely... I don't know where it's coming from. I so see. in a restaurant on the street where there's it's cars. It's jarring. It's scary. It's scary. And I felt really, really vulnerable and overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and what about the hearing in your functioning ear? Is that overcompensating? Is it extra sensitive? Or it's just sort of like that's normal and it's the other one that's just creating this almost ringing white noise and not helping you like balance exactly yeah. the latter so okay. my left ear is just vibing my left ear has <laughs> has remained very consistent and god bless that ear you know i'm very grateful thank you thank you yeah, we're um, the right ear is just up to some some wild stuff and so i was in this place of just like feeling totally totally out of control and mm -hmm. really disoriented and 
I had written a song for a film that actually just came out a couple months ago called Nimona, a really beautiful animated film. It's on Netflix that I can't recommend highly enough. Honestly, having nothing to do with my involvement, just it's a beautiful film that awesome. I was really, really honored to be a part of. So I'd, I'd written the, the original song for it. And they needed me to approve the mix. And I hadn't been listening to music. This was your first challenge. This was my first challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things, I guess you can say, well, hey, I defer to someone else on the mix, but that's not my style. My style is to be like, hey, I have 25 notes on the mix, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I listened to it. I put my phone in mono, which, you know, is a, I will say the iPhone has lots of accessibility options. So if you have hearing impairment or any of this stuff, there's a lot of, or visual impairment, there's a lot of cool stuff that the phone offers. That's great to know. Yeah. Um, so if you go into that accessibility part of your settings, there's a lot of really cool stuff. And so I put my phone into mono, put, put on my headphones and I listened to my own song and that was a that was an interesting experience because i i was forced to confront two things one of which was painful and one of which was really invigorating the first was that music had lost the i am i am being washed over by a thing yeah. and i'm at peace because when I hear sounds, the, the ringing gets worse. So like the louder the environment I'm in, the more the things are going, ding, ding, you know, yeah, kind of poking Yeah, it exacerbates at that. Yeah, that's, that's tough. So that's weird. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I was like, man, ah, oh, right. That's gone. Mm -hmm. That feeling is gone or that feeling has changed. However, the invigorating part was... I was able to go, oh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> you know? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so I think that was, it was kind of funny. And I, I listened to it by myself. I was at my house by myself, I was sitting on my couch. And I actually, I had a, a visceral, palpable sense of relief, <sighs> you know? Yeah. And I, I think I had a sense at that time, okay. There, there's a path forward. Is it's going to be in a different forest? Mm -hmm. I'm in a different. I'm on another planet, but there is a place that I want to head to, and I can kind of see it. So that was that was incredibly. That's invigorating. That's empowering. Um, to you because you're now you're accepting. Mm -hmm. You're accepting, and you're just sort of steering in a new direction as opposed to coming to a dead stop. You faced your fears. You faced your fears. Absolutely. Yeah. And then very shortly after that, and so this was only like, I want to say five weeks after I lost hearing, I went into the studio. Wow. With a, a, tr a trusted friend and producer who I'd been working on a couple songs with on the record. So it's a guy named Jeff Harris mm -hmm. who worked on Punisher, Perfectly Alone, which is the so closer. Good. And then, Are You Serious?, which is the opener. And the night before, I did a voice note just of this chromatic thing on guitar going boom, 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 boom. And I kind of freestyled this, this question of like, dude, are you fucking serious? Yeah. Because I kept, that kept going through my head in this process. You know, a lot of musicians, I mean, a lot of people, but a lot of musicians saw the movie The Sound of Metal. Yes. And I remember wow. watching that and going, well, that's my worst fucking nightmare. Yeah. And then I'm like, wait, <laughs> now it's happening. This is happening. <laughs> this is happening. And so there is that moment when something bad is happening to you. And I'm sure everybody can relate. And I'm sure you can relate. Where you're like, are you serious? Like, is this really happening? There's frustration. There's anger. There's confusion. Like, why is this happening? Totally. And there's also like a a very perverse sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. To the whole thing. Of course. So I had that phrase going through my mind and we got in the studio and I was like, Jeff, 
you know, you know what's happening. This is weird. I don't even know how to approach this. I had this idea last night. And I was like, I don't even know where to start. He's like, I think you should just write down exactly what happened. Who cares what happens to this song? I don't yeah. care. Let's just, just write down what happened. Sing it. And I did. And we ended up making something that was actually quite interesting. Yeah. And a little bit experimental. There's, a, there's tempo changes in it. You know, it, it wasn't like I sat down and wrote a, a generic song that I thought to myself, okay. Not only can I make music, but maybe I can make music in a more interesting way because I, I actually, I'm too confused to give a fuck. <laughs> I love that. I'm too confused to give a fuck. <laughs> it really takes a whole other layer of pressure off so you can just try yes. and experiment yes. and just go with it. Well, and that's like, again, thinking about a debut, you don't know enough when you're starting. To know that something's a quote unquote bad idea or a good idea. You're just doing it. And there's, it's like, it's the, the bliss of being a beginner. Yes. And we're always trying to, you know, I think as a creative person, you're always trying to get back to that place. Um, even, you know, I talk to a lot of people who, you know, write about music or are, are critics of music or whatever. And like, I think a lot of those people are trying to get back to the place of being a fan. Yes. Yes. Right. Once you've seen the other side of it, how do you stay connected to the original germ of the thing, mm -hmm. the original seed, which is that you love music. Right. And you're interested in how it affects you and other people. So it's like, in a way, this helped bring me back to the source of inspiration. Wow. You know? So that's, that's very unexpected. Very cool. Yeah. Like almost like a, a, a grounding force to be a student mm -hmm. to sort of learn this new approach and this new way and this new chapter. I love this album because I do think it's your most experimentation. It's your most dynamic. It's just, it's your most, it's just so, there's so many layers to it. Are, are there certain moments on here that are your favorites or that you're, you're excited for, for fans to hear? Yeah, a lot of moments. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the first track, as, as I mentioned, it's called Are You Serious? Um, it has a, it has a few elements that I think set the listener up to have to like buckle up a little bit for a ride. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, we have a, a ramping up of tempo. We feature my tinnitus noise panned on the right side as I hear it. And that's, as I mentioned, a motif throughout this yeah. record. We've got some interludes. We actually, on the vinyl version of the record, have a track that isn't, going to be on any DSPs. Oh, that's cool. You can only hear it. Old school. Old school. Love that. Which like, you know, I think- That's special. Yeah. That's special. And like, so I just, I feel- oh, I love that. I feel like there were some, some ways in which I, I, I was less concerned with like the correct way to do something mm -hmm. and more interested in a way to do something that felt exciting to me and fun to me and my collaborators. And you know, I brought Paul Meany in. Oh, uh, love Paul so love Paul. much to executive produce this record. I, I've, I'm so glad. I've chilled. I'm so glad when I heard that you guys were connecting because he. Mm -hmm. I've been a fan of his since his Mute Math days, even before he started working with other artists. What a talent. What a great person. And, you know, Paul was very instrumental in creating what, I kept terming productive tension because I really, there were like a few phrases that were guiding this record. One of them was rigor. Mm -hmm. um, and that and that kind of relates to the other meaning of that first song, Are You Serious? Like, okay, something bad happens. Are, are you serious? Yeah. But also, hey, right now in this body, in this life, are you fucking serious? Mm -hmm. Are you going to take things seriously? Are you going to try? Or are you just gonna say, well, I didn't really, I didn't really try and kind of fuck off right. and like whatever? To me, that's so, so not interesting. Mm -hmm. Especially right now, when like the stakes for us as human beings, in my opinion, have never been higher. Yeah. Like there is nothing hotter and cooler and more interesting to me than someone who is serious. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I don't mean like, you know what I mean? Not yes. like interpersonally serious. Right. But like serious about what they do. Committed, devoted, authentic, mm-hmm. real, and passionate. Wi- and willing to be like, oh, you tried hard at that? I don't like it. Mm-hmm. You know? And then you kind of have to sit and go, oh, God, I did try. Yeah. And that person doesn't like it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. That's scary. That's yeah. scary. So Seth and I were talking about, okay, this record, how do we make it great? How do we, I'm already in this place of like, I'm down to make something different. I'm out of my comfort zone already in a hundred different ways. Yeah. How can we lean into that? And so I texted Paul, who I really just knew. We we hadn't worked on much. We'd worked on like a couple little things here and there. I texted him like, hey, do you want to come over for dinner? I had him over for dinner. And I was like, I have a proposition for you. Would you like to executive produce my next album? And initially, he was like, I don't know if you need an executive producer. You oh. know, I played him a lot of what I, what I was working on. He's like, I feel like you're in a great spot. And I was like, yes and no. I, I feel like you do. You should be this person. And so he, he took the music, went back to New Orleans, sat with it for a sec, and then called me and was like, okay, I agree with you. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. He's right. Uh, You're right. Um, And we we then commenced working on this. And it was it was really wonderful. You know, Paul ended up producing some of the songs, but then just overseeing this record and, and pushing me. And that was that was really helpful. And I think it reminded me that when you're already uncomfortable, the best thing you can probably do is become slightly more uncomfortable. Yeah. Push a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting that Paul did that for you. I also love the collaborations you have on this album. Mm-hmm. I mean, so cool because you have like Vic and, and Pierce the Veil, and then you have like Kid's Sister. I mm-hmm. love spaghetti. Like I love that. And that but that's all that's so characteristic of you. You are so genre defying and you you're to go from a rapper, hip hop type artist into straight up alternative queen. Um, you're so amazing. And I think that this album does capture all of your different influences and textures and nuances. Talk to me about some of the collaborations on the album. Yeah. Well, thank you. I I, yeah. I wanted to try to span the gamut yeah. without being uh, too all over the place. Um, so, so both of these collaborations were utterly organic, mm-hmm. which it in my opinion is the best yeah. is the best way to collaborate and you you get the most not just exciting result but like personally fulfilling result selfishly as as a human you right. know so I'll, I'll speak to the vic collab first i had i had the demo for irish goodbye and there were a lot of things i liked about it i also had screamed on it at the end as an experiment i've mm-hmm. never screamed on anything I rarely scream. And I was like listening to it and kind of thinking, man, it's missing something. It's heavy. Well, I have a friend who screams. I have a friend who makes heavy music. He'd probably have an interesting take on this. And initially I was, I was nervous to reach out. I was talking with him about this yesterday. Because I don't know, I never want to bother anyone. You know? <laughs> I'm just You're like, hilarious you think that's bothering him. I know. I this mean, is honestly, this is a problem because of course when people reach out to me, like, hey, would you want to do this? I'm like, oh my God, yes. Thanks first, for this. first of all, it's so flattering. No matter what, it's so flat. It's a compliment. It means totally. I like your work and I'd love to see if we can work together and create something beautiful. Mm-hmm. And you know, Vic had already, our our friendship was already established because of him doing a version of that. He had reached out to me like four years before and came to a show. He was he was working on stuff in Seattle. We were playing there and he was just like, hey, I'm a fan. Yeah. Can we hang? That's awesome. So he had already had that generosity yeah. of spirit. And I was like, you know what? I should just, I should return that generosity Aww, yeah. of spirit. So I reached out to him with the song. He loved it. It was a kind of a crunch time for him because he was about to have his baby. Yes, Violet. So yeah. he was like, okay, well, I'm off tour. You know, they had just finished their first run back. He's like, okay, we, I'm, I'm painting my kid's room <laughs> in preparation. Like that. truly, truly. I and Vic, for, for anybody listening, is 
one of those people who is is as wonderful and kind as uh, as he seems. Mm-hmm. He's he's a really a really great person, and he was like, I think if I can get the room done in time, we can so we can cute. work on this. That's so rock and roll. I it's love very- <laughs> that. I love that. And again, are you serious? Like yeah. you're having a kid. Are yeah. you gonna take that seriously? And yes. so, um, it it all ended up working out. I, I went down to San Diego, which is where yeah. he lives and has a studio. And Jaime from Pierce the Veil tracked all the vocals. They they actually had their setup really dialed in because they had just finished Jaws of Life, their record. And which is so good. Which is a great it's record. So good. And love it. Vic and I, we we did a, a little thing yesterday. So we were talking about this, but Vic was saying to me, I didn't realize this. He was he was very free. He felt very free because I was going to comp the vocals. I was going to deal with all the takes and decide what fit. And so he actually felt very free to just perform and have fun Ugh. and experiment instead of being like, was that take good enough? I got to edit right. it. So it, it, it was, was an energy of sort of release that you guys were sharing. That's the magic. Absolutely. So he felt very free and kind of safe because he knew I was going to make sure it fit and made sense. And so we tried a lot of things and we, you know, he played these kind of demon chords that appear in the first drop and then some other stuff that we featured in the second one to make the song really feel like it evolves and isn't predictable and, you know, adjusted a few lyrics and it just, it was so fun. We finished at like five and went out for dinner. I mean, it was great. It was so easy. That's the dream collaboration right there. Yeah. That's why you can ask for. So that's how Irish Goodbye came about. And then Spaghetti has a has a real interesting story that that Paul Meany is um, at, at the center of. So Paul had asked me to send him, you know, everything I had worked on for the past year, pre and post hearing loss, as part of his um, executive production. Yes. Like his research. Uh, yeah. Research. And one of the things that I had made, so my girlfriend, Sarah, plays bass um, in the band Kid Sister. And right after, and she um, she was like incredibly instrumental in my recovery healing. I mean, oh. she's the one who took me to the ER and, okay. and was like really, really with me and oh. just just like really in it. Um, in a in a beautiful way that that I feel very very grateful for. I'm sure that made this experience that much more like, palatable, like like like, like acceptable to oh, to God. be to have that love and support. Can you imagine going through this alone or no. without that network of love and support? Yeah, no. And this this whole experience to to go on a brief tangent was a reminder of community mm-hmm. and you know i i invest a lot of my time and energy into my my friends yeah and and my family who are also my friends yes and not that you're ever looking for the moment when you can cash in on that yes. you know in a transactional yeah. way but there are these moments where you're like oh right i have built this community and they're actually here for me like that's really what it's for that's yeah. really what it's for. Yeah. And when you when you go through something tough like that or a big loss or a big change and people just show up, it's it's really overwhelming, mm. actually. You know, yeah. it kind of makes me want to cry thinking about yeah. it. Like people just showing up. Um, that's the greatest gift. That is the greatest gift. I think that's all that really matters. Like you can feel like I'm 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 having a good life because if something goes wrong, I have people who are going to show up. Totally. And, you know, I, I, I've thought a lot about being on both sides of that. As, as a human, it also feels so good to be able to show up and mm-hmm. to have someone to show up for. for. Yes. You know, so much, we, you think about like two sides of a mountain, to get to the top, both people have to climb. Yeah, that's and, right. And, and that's like, you know, those really deep, meaningful relationships, I think, mm-hmm. involve that mutual trek. Yes. <laughs> It's a mutual trek. You know, so um, kind of sounds like a sportswear brand. <laughs> <laughs> mutual trek. <laughs> I love that. Um, my new streetwear line. Yes. Uh, so in any case, Sarah had been in the, in the trenches with me. 
And I said to her, actually, right after I wrote Are You Serious, I was like, could we, would you be down? And we had never written a song before, even though, you know, both musicians kind of wanted to keep that separation. Separate, yeah. You know, whatever. And I was like, would you be down to just like write something at home just because I'm trying to get back in it? Um, I was I was still figuring out how to track vocals with one ear because mm. typically I, I used my right ear in the past as my monitoring ear. So I would wear headphones with one ear off. Yeah. And I hear with that one. Well, yeah. Okay, I can't hear with that one anymore. So, you know, I was just adjusting. And she was like, yeah, of course. And so we went into my home studio. I have a little back house. And just freestyled a song called Spaghetti. That's a freestyle? I mean, that the lyrics of Spaghetti <laughs> are incredible and hilarious. And like that song for me is very special. Thank you. No, it's like a it, lyrical gift. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's so good. And it was written with, when I say total unselfconsciousness, I don't think that's an exaggeration. I mean, we we were just having fun. We are just like, you know, in love, having fun. Oh. And, you know, I produced the demo. Actually, the vocals you hear on the the version that's on the record are day of demo vocals. Wow. We didn't re-record them. I have them. to tell you, you can hear and feel that on this record. You can feel it, the flow of it. It just felt so, like, I was, I couldn't believe it. Like, I, I listened to it and I almost, I started it over. I'm like, wait, what's happening here? You know, it kind of was jarring for me because I'm like, this is awesome. Thank you. It's um, a moment of magic on the album for me. And I, I really credit Paul with, I sent him that batch of demos and he was like, well, what the fuck's going on with spaghetti? That. And I was yeah. like, what do you mean what's going on? It's, it was, it's nothing. Right. And I think like, this is, this is another part of the creative process. And I have been resistant to this at times, right? Other people being like, no, actually that's the thing you think is interesting. Isn't interesting. I'm sorry to tell you this other thing, <laughs> you know, you're so attached to this thing. Yeah. But this, and that's something I've gotten better at. I'm still not, you know, amazing. But Paul really fought for that song. And see, that's great. He brought like a fresh perspective. Like mm -hmm. this is special too. And, you know, I think it's a flavor on this record as well. It's a moment of levity. It's a mm -hmm. moment of charm and yeah. nostalgia. It's so good. And purity. You know, it, it was so fun to make. And again, it was. My writing process, for the most part, is very stream of consciousness, very sit down and see what happens. And this was kind of the epitome of that. It was. I think that's your signature. Like when I think about you and your music, I do think it's the, I would describe it as like it's earnest. It's like the earnestness of stream of consciousness, of not overthinking. And, but you have also have this gift where it comes out that way. You know, I think for other people that might not be as magical, <laughs> <laughs> but for you, it's really your thing. No, yeah. thank you. I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting things happen when you open up the valve. Yeah. And everyone has a different approach to songwriting, of course, but I've never been, I've never kept a journal. I never write anything down. I just, I just tap into now. And, and see what's happening. So spaghetti was Aww. was a real exercise in that. I'm really glad you like it. And so- I love it. Yeah, Sarah and I finished it with Paul and just retracked um, some of the instruments and, and recorded some background vocals, the ones you hear at the end. But that song is a real, was just, was a very, very genuine experience. <sighs> it's so good. How did you and Sarah connect originally? So we originally met, we were friends, um, her band opened for me. Oh, wow. Uh, like a year and a half ago or something like that on tour. And then we were friends. And then one day, yeah, one of my, one of my friends was like, what is going on with you two? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. We're friends. And, and she was like, I don't think so. <laughs> so there you go. I'm an uh, idiot. For the proof, like yeah. truly when it comes to like <laughs> romance, I'm just like, I am like a 12-year-old boy, kind of. <laughs> I'm like dumb. But <laughs> so sweet. Yeah. Another example, you have to just, you know, surrender and let it let it be. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And not get in not, the way of yourself. Not get in the way of yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, bringing it back to this record, I almost didn't have the strength to get in my own way. Oh. 
Yeah. You know? Yes. That sums it up right there. I almost didn't have the strength to get in my own way. Wow. And I feel That's like- That's powerful. I know you're a parent. I've talked to my friends who are parents. Sometimes they are so exhausted mm -hmm. and so they too do not have the strength to get yes. in their own way. Like yes. I've, I've talked to people about being the parent of young kids and sometimes that can have these amazing effects on their creativity because mm -hmm. they're just too tired. They're, too, they're just like, yeah. what about this? Exactly. I don't know you, if you've you felt just, that. No, you need forms of like release. Right. Oh, I like, I am like gotten into rock painting, like hardcore. I like literally paint rocks. I know. This is what, so, do, what do you paint them with? Like I have like different paints. You know what it was? I used to always love art. Uh -huh. And then like when you are like, a young adult and you're like hustling, you don't, you don't have time to like do your art. Not that I have the time now, but I almost don't have a say in the matter. I'm like, I must create. And I just I paint. I like do like DIY home projects. I'm like painting a table right now. No, that's amazing. Right? Very handy. I like to be hands on. To me, that's a release. I mean, I think it's a very human. It's human. It's very primal. I uh, one of the things you know, a little PSA for anyone who wants to be a touring musician. You are a mover. Yes. You're just moving stuff around. Yeah. You know, like being on tour is carrying things. Yeah. Yeah, you play the show for an hour. The rest of the time you're just carrying stuff. Very physical. It's it's a very physical job. And I and I do think the that process, mm -hmm. whether it's painting a table, building a table. Build, I love to build, yeah. Setting up an amp, setting up a drum kit. It feels good. It feels good. You're actually about to embark on your European tour, your headlining tour. Mm -hmm. What do you do to get set for this physically, mentally, emotionally? Well, we were talking about this earlier. I quit drinking three and a half years ago. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. That has made touring a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, not only has it taken, you know, we were talking about the decision fatigue of like, oh, should I drink? Uh, well, maybe tonight, maybe not. To for me, that was just had reached a, a point of, yeah, it just exhausting me and wasting my psychic energy of like, I can't be sitting here debating this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't deal with this. I just need to be like, no, the yeah, answer is the no. The answer is no. There's a default answer. Yeah. And um, so so not drinking makes, makes touring a hell of a lot easier. It's easier on your body. You get better sleep. You know, so I'm kind of, from a, from a physical standpoint, that that's hugely helpful. I'm I'm very active generally in yes. in my life, so I'm I'm usually in pretty good physical shape for the for the show. the The big preparation thing is the show, yes, and how we're going to structure it. You know, right now I had a call with my music director yesterday. We're figuring out how to play a bunch of the record live, right. <laughs> That's always the biggest deal. It's like, okay, we have this awesome album. Now we're going to perform it live. And what does that look like? How right. is that going to be? Right. And so this this last tour, so I was out um, with grandson for a few months in the U.S. Was that so fun being together? Yeah. I mean. Former guest on the show. The yes. Two, you, the two of you, your friendship is so beautiful. You know. It's fun. Jordan and I really are like. um we're not like Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels in Dumb and Dumber <laughs> because we're smarter than that. But like, there is an element of just like, we've often said like, we return to a childlike version of ourselves yes. when oh, we're with each beautiful. other. beautiful. And, and so it was really nice, especially for me. It was my first tour back after the, the hearing loss. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even sure how that was going to work. You know, when I'm in dark places as well, my balance is <sighs> shakier. So I was like, well, this uh, is an, kind of a potential nightmare. I was like, am I going to break my ankle? But it, it was a very, a very safe and a really, really fun environment. That's great. You know, it's, it's lucky. You're lucky when you get to do anything with a real friend. Yes. Work with a friend, spend time with a friend. And when you get to do both of those things, it, it's very magical. So we, we kind of spoiled each other a little bit. That was very fun. Um, but we played... A, four, five, five songs from the record on that tour. So I actually have, you know, a sense of, of how to recreate some of the sounds and elements of the record live already, which is right, great. Good. I haven't always had that in the past. And now we're just 
or just figuring out how to make a show that features the new record and also honors the four records that came before it. Oh my God, the four records. I feel very Mm -hmm. grateful that for three of those records, I really got to be part of it with you. And I was so fortunate you would come and and play the music for me first. And well, it all started for me with Blood in the Cut. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing that song and you and I hadn't really connected yet. And I was obsessed instantly. I was like, everything about this, I want to learn about. I want to experience. And that's when I was like, okay, I have to come see you play. And then I, I remember coming to your show and we met backstage and I was like, yeah, like this is my kind of girl. Like I loved you from that moment on. And then, you know, that whole album, you got your Grammy nomination. Yeah. Best rock song. Yeah. What did that moment mean for you? Was that an important milestone? I mean, yes, in the sense that those those types of honors are they're like legitimizers mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. they're kind of a version of some people being like hey you belong here uh-huh. and i think as a as a musician and as a human honestly we're we're always kind of like should i be here mm-hmm. you know often you're at a party you're like am i supposed to be in this room where you know the the feeling of that that imposterness Imposter or syndrome, yeah just a sense of like, what what's happening? Is yes. this okay? Do I deserve to be here? I think it helped. It helped to give me some confidence and reassurance. Like, hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do. And you know, we we did get that nomination for best rock song. For me, what was actually kind of more. Uh, legitimizing or gratifying was we also got nominated for Best Engineering, Engineering for that album. album. Yeah. And that was like, that album was a real collaboration on the the production engineering side between me and a, a bunch of really cool. the people who worked on it. And so I think it felt, it kind of also solidified some of my musical friend group. Yes. Because we're all like, holy shit, dude. Yeah. That's really what? cool. And we got to go together, you know, and yeah. I've always, you know, I have a lot of deep friendships with people on the kind of tech side of music. And I, I really enjoy that yeah. side and learning For about sure. it and, and doing it. And so that was also, that was actually kind of more fun. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, because like music is, you know this, like t- it is a miracle in the same even more so with films and television shows, it is a miracle anything happens. It's true. That's true. The number of people who have to just kind of remotely make an effort yeah. for something it's to the exist. planets need to align. Oh, my Lord. I don't know if people realize, though, you're so interesting, and I kind of touched upon this before, but first of all, you've been doing this for like, what you say, 20 years? I mean, you've been doing this for, for yeah. decades. Well, I made my first song. Um, yeah. Like you've been doing this. Yeah. And then I really, you know, I started playing kind of like shows 15 years ago, like at at a venue. So yeah, I've I've apparently devoted my entire adult life to it. (laughs) But I think what's really cool about you is that you've really created a space for yourself. I, I remember when you, I saw you opening for 30 Seconds to Mars and you came out and you were just so you're effortlessly cool. Like, that's a phrase I don't use often. You know what I mean? I don't think so. I describe you as like, you're, I just think you're very cool. Like, I remember seeing you up and I'm like, she's it. Like, she created a space for herself. That's kind of the hardest thing to do. And I feel like you became this like alternative, like it girl, whatever that means. But to me, I'm like, I love that. And you started collaborating with such interesting people, whether it was Tom Morello or Travis Barker, or Mike Shinoda, grandson, like, Yes, like she totally gets this. Do you feel like you've created a space for yourself? Like, where do you see yourself in the landscape of music? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think I've I've created a space for myself. Mm-hmm. I notice it often when I'm doing press for a record, because increasingly I am not asked to to say what genre I am, (laughs) (laughs) you know? So I don't know. It's partially just the changing landscape. I think people are less concerned with quote unquote genre. genre. Yeah. But I also think I have, I've created a space where people understand that I'm going to 
be in a few things yeah. at the same time and and they're okay with that or it makes sense to them. I I've I've thought about the idea of scene yeah. quite a bit because I have friends who came up in a scene. And there there have been times when I was you know, envious of that. Like, oh, right. Coming up in a scene, there are other bands who do what you do or other artists who do what you do. You can be on bills together. There's a notion of what it should sound like. Right. There are textures. There are styles of performance. There's an aesthetic. And when I, especially when I was starting out, I didn't feel like I was part of a scene. I was seamless. I was seamless. In retrospect, that was kind of the greatest blessing, though, because I got to, not that I made a scene, but I got to sort of make decisions about what I wanted to do creatively that weren't influenced by the outlines of a scene. Right. The borders. Right. Because that can that can be confining and can limiting. Be. It can be. You know, so it's like, it's funny. You talk to someone who comes up in a scene and they're like, oh, I hate the scene. And the goal is to transcend the <laughs> right. scene. And then I'm like, I want a scene. <laughs> Can you put me in a box? Um, but you have been seen. <laughs> right. Yes. So, and now it feels like there is more of a, of a quote unquote scene for alt rock with some of these different influences. And, you know, it's really, for me, it's, it's really fun and gratifying because I, I also do, you know, songwriting with, with other artists and a lot of younger artists who are like, dude, I listened to you in high school. Oh and, my and God. You're I, there now. I love that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so cool. Awesome. So th there's a little bit of, um, I think there's a lot more space for the kind of music that I, I like to make. And especially for, for female artists, I feel like there's a, just a lot more women yes. that I know of who are making sort of alternative, saturated, um, saturated sonically. So that would be, you know, things like using distortion. Yes. Things kind of clipping, things feeling cluttered, not in a bad way, in a good like way. Noisy. Noisy. I and love an noisy. Way. Yeah. Um, I, I see that a lot more in the landscape and it's, you know, it's, it's very exciting to me. It's so exciting. And in and, and moments, I feel like we're kind of back in the 90s again, because there was like a resurgence of women at the forefront of alternative. Like it was such an incredible time. Festivals were being created, you know? And I feel like what I also love is a lot more women are being engineers, producers, working in studios, just more, more women than before, than before this era. Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, the, the more that we can have every shade of everybody yes. represented. And by shade, I don't, I'm not even speaking about like uh, skin shade. I, right. I just mean sort of every variation right. of human. human. Of human. Because like- The full spectrum of human. Totally. And like, yeah. it's, you know, it's interesting if you think about like who is afforded nuance. Yes. Narrative nuance, right? Like if you, if you see like a white dude, right? In, in a movie, like takes any actor, right? Who's a white guy. He could play anything mm -hmm. in your mind, probably in your imagination. Mm -hmm. And maybe he has, like, could be someone who's like, you know, addicted to drugs in <laughs> this circumstance, the CEO of a company, yeah. the president, you know, right. whatever, everything. Right. That's kind of the goal. For I think all, everyone. We need to get yeah. as a standard for everybody. And that, of course, takes some time, but it also involves you know, shining a light on people who are doing unexpected things and, and really, I think, publicly embodying that nuance. Because, of course, every single person is an infinitely complicated person of and contains everything. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see more of that, in, more of that. Yeah. in the music world, and especially in rock. Yes. Oh, definitely. Who would be a dream collaboration for you? Some of those dreams have come true. That's um, so great. How does that make you feel that you've, you've gotten all ready to collaborate with people? Like, were those moments for you? You know, they were. I, th I think there's like, I don't know. It, I guess they are moments. I, I'm sometimes like so in them. Yes. I, I don't have the perspective to see them as moments. But I actually, I was able to to appreciate we we played um with Jordan we played at the Wiltern I don't know 2 months ago or something and Tom Morello came out and did TGIF, TGIF. with us 
and I had to warn him because we cover um, part of Bulls on Parade oh. in Blood in the Cut as right, this like right, right. kind of gnarly thing. And like I'm playing bass and my guitarist is doing Tom solo. <laughs> <laughs> so we were kind of having like, it actually it, doing that reminded me like, oh, right. Tom is a, Tom's like a, He's a legend. A really important, legendary person. He I is. know this. I know this intellectually, but like he and I also have a personal relationship. So, so sometimes, you know, it's like, when, when one of your friends is like, does something really amazing, but they're, to you, they're a friend. friend. Also, he's that cool and nonchalant. So he makes it kind of not easy to forget, but he's just so grounded and cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So he came on and did TGIF with us, which was awesome. And then, you know, I warned him about the, the Bulls on Parade thing. I was like, this is going to happen. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't want you to get triggered, you know? <laughs> and meanwhile, of course, my guitarist, Alex, is like, Sweat. He's like, that's that's nerve wracking to have, have Tom to... Morello watching you attempt th- his guitar part. Oh my god! Yeah. Um, luckily, we'd been on tour for like two months. And, yeah. I mean, Alex is an incredible no, player. Of course, of course. But Tom was there with his two sons, like oh. side stage. I, I was looking into his eyes. I'm like, <laughs> boom, 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 <laughs> boom, 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 boom. I'm like, oh god, dude, I cannot, I cannot mess up. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, he was like, dude, I love that. Oh, um, that's so great. And I felt like, you know, we really love doing that cover for a lot of reasons, but musically, it's just, it's just so fun. Anyways, okay, a current dream collaborator, um, you know, and I like kind of met her for one sec. I am such a big Karen O fan. Ugh. And like when awesome. I saw that Perfume Genius collab on that, on the yes. album, I was like, okay, there's a chance. There's a chance. She's, she's open to she's collaborating. Open to yeah. Collaborating. Um, so that that would That's be a, a dream. Oh God, let's put I, that out because yeah. I would. I personally would love for that to happen. Well, I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. are also a band that has, I think, done a very, very excellent job of evolving but remaining true. Yes, and that's hard. That's very really difficult hard to, to do. do. Very difficult. And you know, it's it. Yeah, there, there's something always fresh about their their music to me yeah. like every record and this new record feels the same way so i would love i would love for that we are seth and i are actually talking about i was like man it'd be kind of sick to collab with benny oh man yeah because like i love that and there's just that that stream of consciousness type feel like i i think a lot of her music has that in unexpectedness and an urgency yes. that i really like and i feel very Another good one compelled by mm-hmm. so put that out into let's the, put that out the ether um yeah i don't know do you have any any suggestions <laughs> i really like the karen o one i feel like that's a good one yeah i'm into it well karen yeah you hear us karen we're we're shouting at you <laughs> we're shouting into the void all right let's do deep cuts okay Name a song, album, or artist that changed your life. Okay, um, album that changed my life, Knives Don't Have Your Back, Emily Haynes' solo record. Totally changed my approach to songwriting. Wow. And I actually only have one comfort album. Only one song I ever listen to when I'm sad, really, consistently across uh, over a decade, and it is Winning by Emily Haynes. It's the last song on that record. That's your go-to. That is it. That was like the second thing I listened to after I listened to my own uh, mix with, with the hearing loss. Wow. Um, and, you know, the other one was a, a song called Mathematics by Most Def, Ugh. which lyrically, I mean, Black on Both Sides was a very influential record for me, period, and for a lot of people. But that song, lyrically, I, I, I don't think anything can really touch that. That's a good call. That is a good Ugh, one. I love that song. What about your first concert? Well, this is hotly contested. I don't really know. Technically, my first concert was like the Beach Boys. Great. That's a great first but concert. But I was like little. I don't What's really. What's your first concert that stuck with okay, you? Okay, here we go. The first concert I bought tickets to. Yes. Coldplay on parachutes. Oh, wow. That's a good one. And I saw Gra- Granddaddy open for them, which is funny now that Grandson is in yeah. my life. <laughs> like, also, just like a side note, the number of older individuals in my family who have like been extremely confused by the stage name grandson. 
just it like, can be confusing. Just yeah. like to throw that out there. A lot of, um, yeah, just some funny text messages. Yes. Um, yeah, so so that Coldplay show was at Aragon Ballroom in Chicago. Oh, that's great. That's a great first show. It was a great first yeah. show. What's a song you wish you wrote? Heads Will Roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good one. Yeah, that song is out of control. <laughs> and I yeah. wish I remixed it too. Yeah. I wish I was Karen O and A-Track. Yeah, that yeah, that's a, that's actually amazing. <laughs> Favorite movie, Clueless. Oh, perfect, great soundtrack. What a time. Oh God. Favorite meal or cuisine? <sighs> Bowl of Cheerios. <laughs> You and Keanu Reeves. What? I asked him. He said just, he said a bowl of cereal with <gasps> milk. That was his favorite. I, he wouldn't give me specifics which cereal, but Cheerios is a good Cheer- one. I mean, it's only Cheerios. Yeah. Okay. I, I normally have three bowls of Cheerios minimum a day. Wow. And are we talking like OG Cheerios or like the apple cinnamon and all of like the 26 varieties or Can whatever? Can you see me rolling my okay, eyes? Okay, yeah. You're like, you're Original a Cheerios. Yeah. It, it goes so far as this. On my rider- is of course Cheerios and full fat oat milk. I love okay, that. So here and that full fat, we get it. And my tour manager on it, she writes Lucky Daddy. Okay, and no touch. She writes No Touch, Lucky Daddy, because I have to have at least one bowl of Cheerios with full fat oat milk about ninety minutes before my show. Oh wow, it's part of your pre-show ritual. It's part of my pre-show ritual. So I've fully just replaced a beer with. A bowl of Cheerios. Um, and I, you know, Cheerios apparently doesn't need a spokesperson. They, Got it. you know, they market largely to like infants and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> they just like don't care and they don't need me. But if if they were interested in tapping into a new type of spokesperson, <laughs> I really am. Like I am, I should be a brand ambassador. I've been, Cheerios has been my favorite food since I was really like one to two or eating solid foods. I have, like, I love Cheerios. I could subsist off of Cheerios. Couldn't be a bigger fan. Wow. If I had to bring anything to a desert island, if you told me I could eat one thing for the rest of my life, it's Cheerios. So it's just that it's the nostalgia. It's just the convenience. I love the, the taste. No, I love the taste. It. I feel good. I feel good after I eat it. I feel energized, like, but also full. But wow. like not too full. Satiating. I don't even need to ask, are you serious? Because you're I serious. Am, I am unbelievably serious. Wow. I'm so glad I asked this question because I had no idea. See, Keanu Reeves could probably be a spokesperson for Cheerios. <laughs> so, Although he wouldn't specify which one. I asked a couple times. And he wouldn't he, say. Wouldn't, he wouldn't. He wouldn't break. He wouldn't break. He just said wonder, cereal, cold milk, any time of day. But see, to me, that's like saying uh, meat. Right, you right, know, so, right. It's too general. It's so general. Like, like Cap'n Crunch. Yeah. That's so a, different than like Raisin Nut Bran. Totally also, Cap'n different. Crunch, can we just say, that's a menace. Your mouth is like basically <laughs> scratchy. bleeding. So scratchy. <laughs> like, so abrasive. <laughs> not to, you not to, to be, shade. You need to be serious to eat that because oh it comes Lord. with some potential injury. Yeah, I'm not, but, I am not eating Cap'n Crunch. I'll tell you yeah. that much. Jared Leto likes Fruit Loops. So you never know. Everyone's got their own like favorite. Wow, really? I yeah. hate Fruit Fruit Loops, like, are crazy to me. Crazy. Oh, yeah. my Lord. Wow. I'm obsessed with this. Wow. Well, another question I was going to ask, what's something your fans would be surprised to learn about you? And maybe it's your obsession with Cheerios, or did they already mm, know that? They know that. Okay. One of my early songs, I invoke Cheerios' first line. Oh, wow. So a lot of the OG fans yeah. know that. Um, it's been a recurring theme. What would people be surprised to know about me? Oh, my Lord. Oh, I know. Because I've, so this is new. I just started watching the Kardashians. Oh, wow. So you're entering into a new stratosphere. <laughs> well, I figure, you know, I just, I'm learning. And now I'm only watching the Hulu one. Okay. So I'm not like, I don't know all the lore. I don't know the whole thing. But I'm just starting to watch. And I'm kind of. How is it? Well, it's interesting. I have some different thoughts. Now, I don't watch really any reality television. I don't watch any, so. So I don't have a point of comparison. Something that I do think is interesting is that I'm loving, which probably is the reason this whole show is successful, so this is arguably idiotic that I'm saying this, are the dynamics of a blended family, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I had a blended family growing up. There's so many subtle allegiances and 
you know, decisions and yes. who to include, who not to. And like just just some of those minor things I find fascinating. Like I'm enjoying watching somebody else think about that. Um, I'm also enjoying there's a lot of like women's issues being discussed, like menopause. The menopause is is on the line. I love that they're so open about it. Fertility. Yeah, it's important. It's important. You know, but at the same time, it's like there's a lot of very valid critiques of of the show and and the um the unrealistic and bizarre aesthetic standards. Oh yes, that yes. it has created. That's so, tough. That's tough. So, but I feel like because I'm coming into it as a grown ass adult, it's not <laughs> affected. It does. It's not really like right, in my right. brain. If you were young and, and impressionable. It might be a different right. Takeover. So I don't know. So maybe. Let me know what you think. Do you watch the Kardashians? I, I don't know. I don't watch The Bachelor. Everybody loves that. Yeah. Maybe I should start watching The Bachelor. I don't watch any of that stuff because I have limited time. And for me, I watch documentaries because I like to learn storytelling and also true crime. I'm a true crime girl. I love to. That's what I watch. See, I love true crime. I'm no crime. For I know. Me. I'm, I, I'm a full on. Full, that my, might be my secret thing. What people might not know about you is my obsession with true crime. That's okay, like my girlfriend thing. falls asleep listening so to I. my favorite murder. So is do this I. a thing? Like, is. What is happening? It is forensic files. Okay, cold let me. Ca- can I ask that. you? Yeah, it's a thing. Is it that what it, is it follows a narrative that is predictable and you enjoy that, or like tell me about? I'll it. tell you exactly what it okay. is. For me, nothing can separate you from your own life. And to put your own mind to rest about anything that you think is important or stressful when you unfortunately are hearing about the tragedy of someone else. So for me, it's like calming personally because it it's like whatever you're stressed about, it doesn't matter. Like this person, this family have gone through hell. So that's that's where it starts. That's where mm-hmm. the calmness comes in. Mm-hmm. But then it's also like this horrible thing happened and this person's story should be heard. So I feel like I'm helping that person's, whether it's their legacy or their memory, by mm. knowing what happened to them. So I feel like I'm there for the family. Um, and three, I love forensics. So I love to learn how the person was caught. Right, the technical the side actual of it. technical side. Like, I could have gone into that. That's how much I love about it, forensic science. So I love to learn how the case was solved. Well, I was, I was talking to my friend yesterday about the Sherlock Holmes reveal and how satisfying that is. Yes. As a, as a viewer, as a reader, whatever, to have someone go, hey, that weird thing that you saw, here's exactly, exactly. what happened. That's, I love that. You know, that. there is a relief there. The problem so I, solving. I just get, I, I, that makes total sense. I just get very scared. Mm-hmm. I'm easily scared. Yeah. Maybe that's something people would be surprised to I, know. That you're easily scared? I'm like a chicken. Yeah. Are there words you live by? Well, he probably. Yeah. Um, you know, there was like a, an adage that was uh, uttered to me as a child, which was, don't curse the dark, light a candle. Oh, that's cool. Which I think is, is good advice to live by. Cursing the dark's a little fun. You got to yeah. do a little, you know, some level of acknowledging the thing that is frustrating, vexing, disturbing, painful, whatever is important. But ultimately, do you want to be in the dark or not? You know? And and so I think one of the things, and, and I guess this kind of relates to even this record. I, one of the things I've been talking about is like, Often in my own music and in my own life, I'm I'm very able to see myself as the the enemy, like or the creator of my own problems. Like, who's really making life hard for me? Right, me getting in your own way. Now, at the same time, the flip side of that is who's the hero? Me, me again. You know, and I think lighting the candle is that version of being your own hero. Wow. And within all of us is the capacity to make decisions, change behavior, change our thoughts, where we can really be the person who gets out of our own way and who realizes when things aren't serving us and can be a great friend, can be a great family member, can be a, you know, a creative person, whether it's painting rocks, building tables, making songs, like that's an important thing too. And so I feel like that's, that's definitely something I'm, I'm trying to live by more and more is like, yeah, okay. I can see how I'm creating problems, but I can also see how there's space for me to create solutions. Yes. 
I feel like the other big thing too this last year, especially, kind of relates to a lot of the the Buddhist like philosophy that I've engaged with and read about and learned about the last you know three four years, which is just like pain isn't bad, right? Like everybody has pain. It, you you cannot find an individual, the most enlightened individual, the least enlightened. Everybody has pain and discomfort. That is that is life. That's it. Life is also joy. Life life is also a lot of other things, but pain is part of it. And so, you know, reorienting to a perspective where pain isn't the enemy, avoidance of pain yeah. is what leads to our suffering, right? Mm-hmm. You talk to anyone who's like really suffering, at the root of that is a reluctance to engage with pain. Yeah. And that that's been really helpful for me, especially with the hearing loss in this last year, being like, hey, this discomfort, this grief. It's not bad. I'm just alive. Right. The only way I'm not feeling this is if I'm dead. Dad, that's right. It just means you're alive. Yeah. So I'm just alive. Mm-hmm. So, okay, if I can sit here and go, this sadness, this loss, this change, it's okay. Yeah. And I didn't do anything wrong. What I need to think about right now is accepting that pain, yes. not trying to like, you know, it was so helpful, like not drinking and all these things where I'd sort of gotten rid of some of those coping mechanisms or distractions so that I actually could just sit with them and be like, oh my God. Use right. your own tools. Totally. Yeah. And it's so confidence building. Yeah. Dear Lord, like when you look a hard thing in the eye, dead sober, and I don't even just mean substance, I mean sobriety yes. of disposition. Yes, and clarity. And clarity. Mm-hmm. When you look at it and and then you move through it, and you actually use it as a way to become more open and more compassionate yes. instead of closing off. Like, you really feel like you feel strong. Yes. Embracing the evolution is the epitome of empowerment. Oh my God. Like, that's it. It's and like, it's facing it head on. Totally. And just looking at it. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think, you know, I previously had been afraid to to engage with pain in mm-hmm. certain ways, you know? And I wanted to get 10 feet away from it, 20 feet away from yeah. it. And, and so it's been, I think, really remembering when I'm, when I'm in a place of discomfort. And by the way, that discomfort can even just be boredom. Be anything. Like, it doesn't need to be like, oh, I just went deaf. Like, it, <laughs> right. you know, it can be right. little. It can be low level, but not just thrash, not immediately thrashing against, I don't like this feeling. Yes. I don't want to have it. Getting a little bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I think, those those two kind of um, frames of reference, they, they feel related, you know? But that's that's sort of where I'm, where I'm at. Uh, you are amazing. I'm just listening to you. I hope that you hear yourself because your story and your journey, which is still going, is really an inspiration. I hope that you feel good about it and realize how many people listening or watching will be inspired. At the end of the day, just face your fears and it's like accepting change and accepting the evolution and like owning it. Totally. No, thank you. Yeah. And I and I do think that point about, you know, there's a there's often a critical period when something difficult has happened. You can face openness and honesty and and orient yourself in that direction. And if you're able to do that in the immediate wake of something bad happening, I just cannot encourage anyone listening or watching to try to take that approach. I haven't always. Yeah. And it's harder. The longer you wait, the harder it is. And because you know, I just with with the hearing loss, it's just it's just so um top of mind, I was immediately, I just told everybody what was happening. Mm-hmm. And I, I was thinking back, um, cause I, I was like, I'm prepping this thing that I, this little talk that I'm doing. And I was thinking back to when my biological dad died, I was really ashamed and I didn't tell people what had happened. He was an addict and had died from that. And this is also a different time. People, there was a much less public discourse 
an understanding of addiction. And so I felt super shamed. And I remember the first, this, this girl, Liz, came out to hug me. I had to go to a basketball awards dinner. And she said, what happened? And I said, he had liver disease. Oh, you couldn't even. And right. I lied. I mean, I didn't lie. I, I omitted and, and sort of euphemistically said yes. something. And I felt, I'll never forget how that felt. And I, and I stayed like that for about a year and a half till I joined this like support group. Yeah. And I, I remember the first time I told people what happened and what a relief. And all of a sudden now my life expands. Now my life. So it's like at these moments, it's not just even facing the fear. It's taking shame out. Yes. Because when you say what's, when you just say what's going on right off the bat, no room for shame to creep in. Right. You know, there's, there's to let it fester. There's no oxygen yes, for that fire. Right, right. So that's just another thing I've I've thought quite a bit about. Like I posted on the internet, told everyone in my life, this is what's happening. Yeah. Instead of just like kind of being in distress and then being like, how do I talk about this? I like that because it also forces you to now adapt immediately. Right. It forces you. It doesn't allow you to get in your own way. Totally. Yes. And that's you're you're totally right that you you kind of skip the step. Where it sits with you. Of the explanation. Yeah. The reckoning. And the overanalysis of mm-hmm. it. Because that can do a number on your head. Yep. So Absolutely. you're like, here's what's happening, <laughs> and I'm going to take it on, and we're going to move forward. Yes. Yeah, that's really good advice. So that's something, too. That's, that's a great takeaway. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I mean, you have had a lot going on just the last couple of years, w- w- one year, but the last this last chapter for you and this album to show for it, it's really, it's triumphant. It's a triumphant story. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you. Me and too. I just, I always love talking to you. So. Likewise. Thank you. Kay Flay's story is absolutely riveting. It is so powerful to hear how she turned something so formidable into a form of freedom. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. It is now time for my sound advice, new music you need to know on the Allison Hagendorf Show playlist. We must kick it off with the song from today's guest, Kay Flay. Her album, Mono, is about to come out, and I'm still loving the one that she did with Vic from Pierce the Veil. Kay Flay shared with me that she was nervous to ask Vic to be part of it since they are such good friends, which shows how humble she is. Of course, Vic wanted to be part of this awesome song. They complement each other so well on this one. Check out Kay Flay featuring Vic Fuentes of Pierce the Veil with Irish Goodbye. Next up is my friend Renee Mata and his band Reach NYC. Their album Ride or Die is out today. The songs are about Renee's relapse after years of sobriety, his descent into depression after the suicide of his close friend Chester Bennington, and his fight to get back his life. This song is specifically about Chester and the bond they shared. Check out the song out today, Ride or Die. Also this week is the debut song from independent artist Dunes. Dunes frontman Harrison Cohen is from my hometown of Rockland County, New York represent, and cites the killers, Interpol, Walk the Moon in the Back Scenes as influences. Listen to his debut single out today, Fever Dream. That's my sound advice this week. Search for the Allison Hagendorf Show playlist wherever you listen to music. Thank you so much, as always, for being part of the Allison Hagendorf Show. New episodes drop every Friday, so make sure you follow and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. You can find the show wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can also watch the show on YouTube. I would love to hear from you, so please like, comment, rate, review, whatever you're feeling, and reach out to me on socials at Ali Hagendorf. I would love to connect with you. Let me know who I should interview next and who I should feature on my sound advice. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. And remember, you're a rock star. Hold up. 